Um, so the purposes of these sessions, um, again, session one, for those of you who are able to join us um, for session one, we talked about U.S. imperialism and the history of Haiti and how it got to be where it is at this point. Um, the objective of our session two is to discuss the displaced Haitian communities and the oppressive policies um, that are in place that have kept Haiti in the state um, of affairs that it is currently experiencing. And the third session, and we hope that you join us for that, is going to close the loop on the global migration um, that we're experiencing. We created this working group in response to the crisis that occurred in Texas, and we wanted to highlight its root causes and also to highlight the global context in which it sits. Um, for anybody who's existing. interested in this, um, in this topic or wants to be a be part of the we would love for you to go ahead and email the working group um, if you wanna be involved. Um, so really quick for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tony Esselin. I'm a Haitian American internist and pediatrician here in New York, works with health equity and social medicine, has been working with CAR for a few years and I'm happy to be your moderator here today. So we're gonna give it a few more minutes and then I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, our first speaker, um, who is also going to help us hold some space for our beloved mentor. Hey, everyone. Um, I want to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Um, Gerline Joseph is the co-founder and executive director of Haitian Bridge Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization that advocates for fair and humane immigration policies and provides migrants and immigrants with humanitarian, deportation defense, legal, social services with a particular focus on black migrants from the Caribbean and Africa, the Haitian community, women and girls, LGBTQA plus individuals and survivors of torture and other human rights abuses. We are really excited to have her speak to us today. Ms. Joseph. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Honor respect à tout le monde. Uh, my name is Gerlin Joseph and co-founder, executive director of the Haitian Bridge Alliance, co-founder of the Black Immigrants Bell Fund and founding member of the Cameroonian Advocacy Network. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment of silence to honor the life and legacy of our dear departed friend, humanitarian justice warrior, health warrior, for people around the world, our beloved Dr. Palmer. Please, let's take just a few seconds to remember his work, his legacy, his love, his fight for all people, for justice, for health justice, for health equity, for health equality, not only in Haiti, not only in the United States, in Rwanda, where he passed, our prayers to his wife, Zizi, his children, his beloved family at Partners in Health, to each and everyone that he has touched, helped, talked to, those who have read his book. Today, we honor him, we honor his life, and we say thank you to him for all he has done, for all he was, for all he is, and for all he will continue to be. May he continue to guide partners in health and all those who are fighting for health justice around the world. Let's take a second. Well, thank you so much again. Um, you know, we, when we were planning this, I, I didn't think it would have been so heavy to talk about, you know, especially looking into where we are when we look into migration of black bodies around the world, when we look into Haiti and Haitian migration, we cannot move forward without stopping and looking into the root causes of migration. I believe that a lot of folks were able to either participate or listen to the first session 
that actually took a look at historical realities of Haiti placement in the Caribbean, in the Western Hemisphere, and in the world. And we understand that the very existence of a, of a country like Haiti, the very existence of the people, the language, the culture, the identity, still and continues to be unacceptable to the West. And we see that we must look at the root causes of migration for Black people, but specifically people from Haiti. We understand that the current flow of migration started as a result of the earthquake of, 2020, of 2010 that killed over 250,000 people, leaving millions without anywhere to go to survive and to move forward. And we clearly understand that people moved to countries such as Brazil as part of a humanitarian program. They needed labor and hundreds and thousands of Haitians, young, middle-aged, went to Brazil in search of life. I can give you a brief background of how I came to be in this work so that we can connect where we were, where we are, and maybe where we might be heading. I received a call in 2015 and I was told there were black migrants at the US-Mexico border. That is the border between Tijuana on the Mexican side and San Diego on the US side where I am currently. Out of curiosity, I got in my car and went to see what was happening. And I met with the first 12 young men and women and I could not believe it. And I was asking them, what are you doing here? How did you get here? And I can never forget the stories that were told by the 12 young men and women between the ages of 19 and 25. The majority of them were survivors of the earthquake. They lost their homes, their parents, their families, and all of them made the way to Brazil. At the end of 2015, many of them felt pushed to leave Brazil due to political turmoil, due to dealing once again with the need to search for life. They walked from Brazil to the United States. And I will repeat, they walked from Brazil to the US-Mexico border. It is a journey that takes between three to five months. And unfortunately, many of them did not make it. And when I asked, why do we have 10 young men and two women? And they smile and they say, Madame, for gain fam na fam, for gain garçon na garçon, for you to make this, this, this journey. Meaning you have to take all the strength that you can master in order for you to survive that journey. For them to go to 11 countries, for them to cross 11 borders, for them to go to the Darien Passage, to the mountains in, 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 in Colombia, the jungles, the rivers, to make it here. That's the background that we started seeing in 2015. And that is still what we are seeing today. People fleeing because they are unable to stay home due to natural disasters, man-made disasters, internal violence, external violence that makes it nearly impossible for people to live day to day. It is painful, but it is also give me hope to see how my fellow compatriots, men and women carrying children in their backs, carry pregnant women carrying babies in their bellies because they know they have hope that something must be better. As we all saw in September in the Rio, Unfortunately, for a lot of people, 
that has been the realities. In the quest for life, they have been met by violence. They have been met by prejudice. They have been met by racism. And many of them have been met by death. But finally, in September, the world was able to see the realities that we have been telling them and the world was upset and people were outraged and all of those people have been erased through deportation, through expulsion. To date, the United States have deported 20,000 people to Haiti. That includes pregnant women, children as young as just a few days old. And how do we come into play? Pushing for freedom, liberation, pushing for protection and understanding that seeking asylum is the right thing to do. Seeking asylum is the legal thing to do. But as we look as of yesterday, we are also seeing how even the Dominican Republic is starting to build a wall between Haiti and the DR, and we clearly understand, as I am literally at the US-Mexico border, that borders only apply for those who are less privileged. Borders only apply for those people in search for freedom and protection. Because if you have the right paperwork, if you have the right skin tone, if you speak the right language, if you are rich enough, there is no border for you. You can travel as you please. You can get on your private jets and you can get medical care. You can get health care. You don't have to flee. So therefore the very construct, the very idea of border is simply created for those in need to continue to keep them in check, to continue to keep them in place, to continue to allow them to die. So today, as we gather in remembrance of Dr. Palmer, we must look into ourselves and understanding that anti-Black racism is not only in the United States, but it's in every country that we see people traveling. It's in Colombia, it's in Panama, it's everywhere. So we come asking, how do we move forward? How do we make sure we center the lives, the narratives of black immigrants, of Haitian immigrants, looking into what causes of migration, making sure that in order for people to be safe, for them to stop being displaced internally and for us to curve forced migration, we must have sustainability, starting with healthcare, education, structure, hospitals, making sure our women, our daughters, our young girls are educated, are empowered, are leading the way. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I am honored and humbled to be a part of this fantastic panel. And please, as we say, many hands lighten the load. Merci en pile. Powerful stuff. Thank you so much, Ms. Joseph, for sharing um, your experience and, and getting us all mobilized to, to join you in this fight. Um, I want to go ahead and uh, present our next speaker, who is going to uh, be a great accent to what Ms. Joseph has just shared with us. Um, Miriam Chancy is a patient Canadian American award winning author of the book What Storm, What Thunder that came out in 2021 about the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. She speaks and writes about its aftermath and how it has contributed to the backlash toward Haitians and Haitian migrants in the DR and other parts of Latin America. Ms. Chancy. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening, wherever everyone is. Um, I am the author of What Storm, What Thunder, 
And what I wanted to share with you today were some of the background uh, to what is happening today that we see happening in the Dominican Republic and in South America, Latin America with Haitian migrants and how this is rooted in the experience of the earthquake. And there are a few ways that I can share this and, and I can work through my slides without you seeing them. And I hope uh, the message will carry through uh, in that way in any case. Um, so in What Storm What Thunder, I tell the story of the earthquake through 10 narrative voices from three different family groups, mostly in Haiti, but also from one voice outside of Haiti and one in Rwanda. And what I attempt to do is to show on a very human scale, an intimate scale, what it was like for people to have their lives uprooted, upended through the earthquake and the kind of efforts that it took in community and collectivity to get through the experience, to live the experience. But at the same time, I also wanted to show that this was an also a very individualized experience that every individual who went through the earthquake experienced it differently from others. And that in the aftermath of the earthquake, how to rebuild was also often not a collective uh, understanding. And this is because when we see cataclysms on our television screens or read about it in newspapers, we often don't get that human dimension and even less so for places like Haiti that are already mythologized often in very negative ways. And so I wanted to speak a little bit about the idea of living with runes. And I'm going to start with a character named Malou, a market woman. And Malou is a woman who is 75 years old. So in terms of the span of the narrators, you have a 75 year old woman down to an 11 year old child. And they are from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ages, uh, different genders. And Malou represents that wisdom of the elders who are often not talked to, especially women of lower socioeconomic background, market women, who we often see portrayed in photographs when we see information about Haiti, but who are not often asked what they believe about the global situation or what they witnessed. And having in my life, a great grandmother who was a market woman who made it possible for me to be here. I know that these women hold the keys to the future. So I'm going to read from Malou and then I will make a connection uh, to the DR that might be a little unexpected. So this is her reflecting on the earthquake two years later. We'd lost our legs, sea legs, land legs, the ability to stand up for ourselves. I needed to cleanse the bones myself to put all this behind me, return to the land, to my mother's land, remember everything and forget the last two years of death begetting death. But for some time before going to the waterfalls, to Sodo, I did not know where to start, how to rise again and set out. I am just an old market woman, a relic. Yes, yes, me, Malou. I admit finally that these bones of mine are old, worn out, fragile like the eggs I take to market that everyone wants, even the Dominicans. I never thought I would see the day that Dominicans would want anything we produced for ourselves, but all they really want is to sell us their good for nothing eggs produced in factories. My eggs are warm from being dropped from the hens in size. That's how fresh they are, that fresh. I am trying to read slowly, but it's difficult to read from a poetic text very, very slowly. I apologize to the interpreters. Fresh like Jonas, who used to count his steps all over the market, counted how many of everything I had to sell, how much I made with every sale, counted the eggs I had to see how many his family might purchase. They were five altogether, not the poorest, not the richest, just counting their pennies like all of us, 
counting and putting them away when there weren't enough to buy what they wanted. Don't worry, I told him when he would come to me with his fingers filled with grimy folds of paper, our useless goods. Don't worry, I'd say. You save and one day you'll have enough to purchase the whole dozen. For you and for your family, the whole carton just for you. He would smile when I said that, be less embarrassed if that day he had been sent to purchase two or three eggs, sometimes only one. He came that day to get one egg for his mother, but he never reached home. I watched. That's what old market women do. We watch. But this time, the lot of us market women sprang to action, even as our bones creaked for lack of cartilage and oil. Like the others on the street, we use anything in hand we could find. Useless things like spoons and forks, the metal ends of umbrellas, as if our puny things, our fingernails could move all that. Only the lucky were saved. Being lucky meant simply that you were closer to the surface or that fewer things blocked the way to being found. We heard people on their cell phones all up and down the street, begging frantically for help, giving directions to where they thought they were beneath the rubble within the rooms of their houses. Phones rang and we heard people answer them then fewer and fewer voices. The tinny, persistent ringing of cell phone tones, different songs rising like wind from underground with no answer. We heard our own voices screaming at each, uh, at each other, asking for help, not knowing what to do. Faces covered with dust and sweat and other things later to be determined what to do. There was nothing to do but to scream, try anything, flail our hands, scratch at the earth like my chickens when they get confused because their fresh laid eggs disappear one by one and still they lay more. And so I begin there and within the novel there is a uh, a repetition of this metaphor of eggs. And this is somewhat important because when the earthquake occurred, and, and there's a report you can find uh, from 2011 online, uh, the Dominican Republic opened its borders and did provide post-earthquake assistance. And according to the Center for Strategic and international studies based in Washington, uh, the DR was seen as having provided appropriate disaster risk management because of its proximity and infrastructure. And in that report, it stated that Haitians should aspire to uh, achieve Dominican prosperity. What is not reported in such documents is that private enterprises made agreements within two weeks of the earthquake across the border to secure the rights to the mining of land rich in natural resources on the Haitian side, along with Canadian companies actually. Um, and one of the compelling market reasons that drove the September 23rd, 23rd uh, 2013, excuse me, ruling of a constitutional tribunal, ironically enough, was eggs. And this is why I wanted to read from that section where Malou talks about her eggs. And in the novel, there's a recurring metaphor about the eggs, purchasing eggs, being able to access eggs. Um, and the Haitian government in the summer of 2013 actually refused the importation of Dominican eggs into uh, the into uh, Haitian territory. And one economist, Paul La Tortue, argues that it was this shift towards self-sustenance in the aftermath of the earthquake 
which in some ways compelled the constitutional decree of 2013. Paul Latortu talks about the fact that in 2010, the Dominican Republic sold 250 times what it purchased from Haiti to Haiti. And of course, that ruling of 2013 has other anti-Haitian sentiments attached to it, going back to, uh, because the ruling itself is retroactive to 1929, which marks the rise of the power of Rafael Trujillo and the rise of Blanquimiento, and also uh, goes back to a land survey of 1930, which gave more land to the Haitian territory than to the DR. And of course, as you probably discussed in your, your last meeting, uh, in the 1930s, we saw mass expulsions of sugarcane cutters from the Dominican Republic and from Cuba. And of course, we know of a 1937 Canefield massacre or a corte uh, under Trujillo. But today, only half of Dominican Haitians work in the Batayes. And this is the argument that is used in the DR that there are too many Canefield workers, but only half of Dominican Haitians work in the Batayes. And overwhelmingly, 70% are actually born in the Batayes and therefore Dominican by birth. The ruling is such that it has created a situation of de facto statelessness where there are no protections under international law. And this is where we have to be very concerned about what is happening to this population. Of course, we know that the death toll of the earthquake was over 300,000. It left over 1.5 million food and shelter insecure. 300,000 people were injured and yet billions of dollars went into Haiti and we don't really know what has happened to those funds. So another character in the novel, Olivier, and he, there are, uh, there's a couple in the novel and they are the parents to the child, the 11 year old that I mentioned, who's also a narrator in the novel. These two parents talk about their experience of losing all of their children ultimately to the earthquake. And Olivier is a character who is also an accountant and is trying to understand only months after the earthquake, what is happening to all these millions of dollars going into Haiti. Uh, the Haitian Times reported on the anniversary this year of the earthquake that $16.3 billion went into Haiti. Only 6 billion of that money is accounted for. And yet less than 1% of government-to-government -government aid went to the Haitian government. So the idea that corruption in Haiti is the reason why this money has had little to no effect on the average Haitian is untrue. But we need to think about this issue of aid and how it reaches people to understand why there has been so much out-migration from the country as well. And so I'm going to read a brief passage from Olivier reflecting on this issue of aid. This is Olivier. It's been less than three months and there's been a mad dash for pledges from what they call the international community. What community there is, I don't know. Millions from Cuba, Venezuela, Brazil. God knows from where, hundreds of millions, thousands of millions, maybe trillions. Unbelievable that it took this, an earthquake, to open the coffers, abra cadabra. Imagine if every single Haitian who lost someone could get their hands on some of that money, decide what they needed for themselves, their family. You could create a healthy working middle class and still there would be millions amassing in a treasure trove behind them. But of course, they won't allow that to happen. They tell us first that we need to learn our lesson. Death by hunger isn't enough. Then that we need to build better infrastructure. Then that we need to unlearn our corrupt ways, stop killing each other, have fewer dreams for our children. 
because everyone knows that we are a dreamless people. Be good factory workers so that those who are already millionaires can become billionaires and billionaires can become zillionaires. In short, aspire down, not up. And if you read the novel, Olivier is very bitter um, and he moves to a larger camp in search of work, a camp where they've been promised factory work, factory work which will never come. And so this movement into the IDP camps also for many Haitians was a, a state of statelessness, being refugees within your own country, which is the definition of an internally displaced people's camp. And many Haitians, not only because of the losses that suffered uh, during this period, personal losses, material losses, the lack of aid reaching them directly. And there are still to this day, according to the Haitian Times in February, 200,000 people uh, living under tents. I think this is including the people who went through the August 2021 earthquake who are still without homes uh, until 2019, there were 50,000 people. So imagine a 10, 12 year period where people are still not given the means to reconstruct their lives. And so this is what forced many Haitians to leave Haiti, whether it was in 2010 or it was in 2012 or 2013 or 2014. And as Gerlin described, many people had to leave Haiti and move through sometimes 11 countries before arriving to, as we saw last year, the US-Mexico border. One of the things that, that sometimes is not remembered is that in 2010, countries like Chile, Ecuador, Brazil, Latin American countries provided work visas and paths towards uh, naturalization. And what people were, were getting away from, and I'll just end with um, just one last passage from the novel, was the difficulty of living in perpetuity in the camps. And so I'll read from Olivier's wife's passage. Her name is Sarah, and she has lost two children. She's about to lose a third. And this is what she says about the camps. Her rage manifested itself in a refusal to conform to camp life. The lining up for rice delivery, the rice was meted out by plastic cupful from fat white burlap like bags emblazoned with a red, white, and blue of the American flag. Scrawny children who seemed to belong to no one moved through the sinew of legs with eyes trained to the ground, picking up fallen grains into the palms of their hands. The lining up for water when the big truck with a rounded back came trundling down the broken cement, spilling half of its contents along the way and more when it stopped to open the faucets installed at the back before anyone was ready to fill their containers, ranging from small chipped china cups to emptied coffee cans to multicolored Tupperware to, at the beginning, the large translucent containers designed for hauling water from distant wells that some had had the foresight of toting with them rather than attempting to save photographs and whatever trinkets they held dear that meant nothing to anyone else on earth. The lining up to take a piss in the trenches dug out along the extremities of the camp by men who spoke a language no one could understand. Though some looked like them, dark of skin and gaunt, as if they came from a place where food was also scarce. The lining up, the lining up, and now the pawing at night. Why had the ground opened up and swallowed them whole, only to leave her alone walking the broken roads? So food insecurity, living insecurity, of course, we know that there was a lot of sexual assault in the camps. And so just bodily security was, was something uh, that people and people today still live with. And she mentions here uh, the UN workers 
<clears throat> excuse me, the South Asian contingent that also produced cholera in, uh, in Haiti in the months after the earthquake, when we know that at least 5,000 people died and over a million people were affected with the reintroduction of cholera into the country. And so sometimes aid comes with un unforeseen calamities such as that. And so all of this, all of these calamities together, loss of life, loss of health, produce this out-migration. And as I mentioned before, Chile, Ecuador, Brazil provided work visas and paths towards naturalization. But as early as 2012, many of these countries stopped renewing visas for Haitian migrants. And, uh, and then recessions occurred, for example, the Brazilian recession in 2015, resulted in, in forcing Haitian migrants out from Brazil to Chile. And then there were, as in, there is in the United States and elsewhere, anti-immigrant sentiment rose, the racialization of foreigners continued, and then the impact of COVID-19 conspired to force Haitian migrants to move from one Latin American state to another. Um, I wrote this novel because as someone who is part of a Haitian diaspora at this point, and part of one of the largest groups of, of Haitian uh, diasporans, you know, Haitians are in large numbers in the Dominican Republic, uh, in Brazil, Haiti, uh, excuse me, in Canada and the United States. And our remittances to Haiti actually constitute 40% of Haiti's GDP. What I have to wonder about is what happens when Haitian migrants are not considered either part of Haiti itself or part of uh, the diaspora and, are not, and their humanity is disregarded. I wrote this novel to humanize the understanding of what happened during the earthquake, the ways in which the dignity of those who survived was often disregarded from all points of view. And that the migration, the out-migration of Haitians is not a result of a lack of will, but in fact, in the very opposite, it is about uh, ensuring that they're able to live uh, with dignity wherever they may go. So I hope this has uh, assisted in thinking about the consequences of the earthquake in producing this out-migration and thinking about the relationship to aid. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. How beautifully, beautifully done. Um, thank you so much for sharing your beautiful novel, your words and your perspective. And what a, what a wonderful way to try to encase the, the humanistic perspective with the political context. Um, very well done. Thank you so much for sharing. And I have lots of questions <laughs> um, that hopefully we'll have some time to, to get to um, toward the end. Um, and now to round out this amazingly powerful discussion, we're going to uh, introduce Arlene Cruz Carrasco. Um, she is a lawyer and as a colonial feminist for the Network of Gender Migration and Development in Spain, Red de Migración, Genero y Desarrollo. She is also one of the teachers at the Decolonized Feminism School in Barcelona, Escuela Feminista de, Col de Colonial, and I had the pleasure of participating in one of their political education sessions back in December where we met. Um, so without further ado, um, Ms. Carrasco. Hi, Tony. <laughs> Good to see you again. <laughs> um, you. Buenas tardes. Um, maybe it's morning in the uh, US, sorry, but <laughs> good morning, everyone. Uh, if you are located in the, in the Americas. Um, I was going to share a, a PowerPoint, but I will do it um, as my colleagues uh, did it, just uh, speaking. I will apologize uh, myself because um, English is my third language. Second will be French. So, um, and the first one will be Spanish. So I'm sorry if I don't pronounce or my vocabulary is not the best one <laughs> talking in some of the topics uh, we are um, sharing today. But um, um, yeah, um, I was want uh, I wanted to share with you um, some of the um, the policies we have now uh, implemented in Dominican Republic against 
a Haitian um, community. To start um, understanding this, we have to go back to the, to the history so we can understand why sometimes Dominicans take this approach on how to handle this topic or this uh, situation. The independence that we celebrate in Dominican Republic is not against the Spanish kingdom. Um, we were independent uh, at, the, at the beginning, that was back to 1821. Then we were occupied by Haiti. And this, uh, the independence that we're celebrating now is against this occupation. So um, if you take the history, just this part of the history, you say, okay, you don't want them back into your country. You want them to stay in their side of the island and you share it, but that's all. But that's not the real situation. We, after, after this independence, we will be sharing um, uh, workers. The um, migration between the, the borders were allowed. Even um, some, when I was a child, they were allowed to even make a, com uh, a market in, uh, at the border so we can share um, uh, goods and um, many, many items. But I believe back in the 90s, the, the politicians and the government decide to stop and break this completely. Um, and they were starting uh, these policies about not giving the descendants from Haiti the signs, uh, the Dominican document, the ID, we will say. So what happened before, before that? After the independence, the border were quite open. We were sharing workers. Uh, even uh, many, many um, of our enterprises in Dominican Republic were also having a second uh, branch in, in Haiti. But the thing was that uh, with uh, Trujillo, I, I think it was uh, Miriam who talked about it, um, there was a, a massacre um, that uh, took place in the 1937. At, at, at this point of the history, what um, happened was that um, this, uh, this president decided that all the person everyone that was not allowed to pronounce well uh, a word that is uh, perejil in Spanish, that will be firstly in English, even if they were born in Dominican Republic, they, will, they, will, they were be hated. So this massacre took about 20 to 30,000 lives. After that, Dominican Republic was a file of like, um, um, they, they were a trial, so we had to uh, compensate for those lives, for each of those lives. So um, after this, none of the, nothing else like a big impact or genocidian um, issues happen against the population of Haiti. Now they are trying to do something similar, but um, taking into consideration being under the law or taking into consideration what the law says or what the law doesn't say. So you can, you can take this advantage of that. So recently, recently what we ha have fa uh, faced is that the Supreme Court of Justice in Dominican Republic, most likely the constitutional branch of it, decides that all the Dominicans born from descendants from Haiti, uh, Haitians, they are not Dominican if they cannot prove that uh, when they were born, their parents has, uh, had a current um, residence or, or, or permit or they were already citizens um, of Dominican Republic. So this ruling when, um, was uh, taken um, back until 1929. So all, all, the, all the citizens, Dominicans for me, born in Dominican Republic, faced that they were no longer Dominican, if they cannot prove this. So most of my friends that studied with me in the university, they were forced to leave Dominican Republic 
they are now living uh, abroad. Some, some of them in Europe, some of them in, in US, others are in, in uh, South America. And um, they were also writing about this and how from one day to another, you can lose your, your identity, um, you know, uh, because they were feeling that they were Dominican as, as me. So I think to understand why we take, because this ruling was uh, added by 15 judges, three of them uh, were um, against this, so they didn't sign but the majority did, so it passed as always. I believe that um, why we took this decision and this decision is in for in Dominican Republic or why we decided this way is because we have to go back to our colonial legacy. Dominican uh, Dominicans, we are really racist. I will not deny this. We, we want, don't want to, um, admit that most of the population is, is Afro-descendant. We believe that we have to be all the time more um, like white people. So we try to make ourselves, you know, more resemblance to, the, to, to white. We understand that black is bad and that's a pity because um, I believe after the the colon the you know all the Spanish colonialists um, took um, took all our uh, native population from the Dominican Republic, the best that they were left with was all the African people living there. So now all what we have, our traditions and all, all that, is because of those people that were slave. So um, I don't understand why sometimes we want to forget that we are black. So it, in any case, not only this for issues that uh, take into, condition, into consideration borders and citizenships, we need to know that, um, like for example, for ourselves, for me as a lawyer, I'm not allowed to go to the court with curly hair. I will have to go to the beauty salon. Um, if you have the hair like this, you cannot have your ID, even a passport to take the picture. They force you to go to the beauty salon. Um, um, if you, um, like for example, um, we had a case um, of uh, Miss um, Dominican Republic, um, this um, beauty, you know, um, um, title. And uh, she was like, uh, she was uh, Afro-descendant. They said she was not Dominican, she was from Haiti because she was black. So the thing is that um, anything that, anything that we consider that um, is not white or, uh, <laughs> or more like white people, we said it's not Dominican. They're, they're from Haiti, this is not us. And that's not the truth. So this is one of the issues. Don't, the second issue that we have is like, we are all the time looking to the North and the North is not always the better solution. So that's why we are building this uh, wall as uh, Gerlin said. And uh, that's one of our policy that uh, we want to create the same thing that the US is doing with uh, Mexico. And, um, and we want to separate the border. Uh, so um, so they, don't, they, don't, they don't cross it. The thing is that um, we have many, many um, um, sectors, um, industry sectors in the Dominican Republic Dominican population doesn't want to work in those uh, posts, like for example, construction. So um, all the construction work is made by Haitian people. It's like also um, uh, Miriam was saying, many of, uh, of uh, the persons doesn't know what a bate is. Bate is one of the, the work that Dominican Republic uh, people doesn't want to do. So it's a uh, cut sugar um, cane. So um, as they don't want to do this, 
they are paid for doing this work and then come back to Haiti. So they have only provisionals, um, provisionals um, papers. And then, um, but what we are forgetting here is um, that if a um, Venezuelan person or Argentinian one comes to Dominican Republic, they can have quite easy um, residence permits, but if it's from Haiti, we ask three times more papers and we try all the time to deny this. And I don't believe uh, we can do this even when we are talking about that we took out the, the certificate of birth of many, many child and children that had to be um, educated and they are not Dominican, but they are not from Haiti. They are not from nowhere. So we, we have to um, consider it that when Dominican, uh, Dominican people go to the United States to have births to their kids, so they, they are born there and they will have the US passport. And then you, for the, for, because you don't want, you say no, because this, this person doesn't have a permit. He, he, won't, he won't be or she won't be um, considered Dominican. So for the things that we want, or we consider that we can take advantage of that. So you can do it, but you are not allowed to any others who wants to do it in your country. It's like, um, okay, I'm going to my visa to US, I'm having this kid, and then I'm coming back with, um, you know, because um, he was born there. Um, he will have this um, U.S. certificate, but um, I don't doing this in my country for uh, for um, the country that is next to us. And um, and we are talking about human life, and I, I don't believe we we can just deport people when they are having um, they are having they are giving birth in the hospital, or they are having the symptoms of giving birth. to put it in a bus? To cross the border, this is not how we we treat humans' life, and um, it's quite difficult for me to speak for a country where this policy I totally disagree. And um, I understand that many things happen in the history. I understand, but we cannot we cannot take this to 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 build. Um, not only the wall, but to build an, um, a, a stream way to think about, because this is not only Haiti. This is, this is being against yourself, being against your identity, be, being against all, all your um, ancestors. So I, I think we need to really, um, read again the history, he, uh, read who wrote the history, how we apply this to our life and to change our way of thinking, like Fanon said. So I'm living here. I hope you got my, my message or what I wanted to share. And uh, if you have any questions, so we can share it now. Thank you so much, Arlene. Oh my goodness. That was incredibly powerful and enlightening. Um, there was a lot of information there that I wasn't even aware of. So thank you again for sharing. We are gonna go into our question and answer session, but before we do that, I wanted to um, ask if uh, Ms. Joseph could come back on and um, provide for us a call to action um, with, the, with the Haitian Build uh, uh, Bridge Alliance. Um, that would be amazing if she's still on. I think she's still on. Ms. Joseph, are you still on? Yes, I am. Awesome. Mm. Fantastic. Yes, I oh. am. Um, and um, thank you so much. Wow. Powerful and amazing. You know, every day we learn something new. And what Ms. Cruz just shared you know, I remember growing up, my dad indoctrinated me by the by the time I was five years old. And despite here that she was mentioned, my dad told me the way that the Haitians could not really use their tongue to 
have the rolling of, of the R to be able to capture that. And that was the deciding factor of, of life and death. And the other thing she mentioned is, is the fact that you have to straighten your hair and be as white as you possibly can be in order for you to be an attorney to work to, to uphold the law, quote unquote, you have to be as white as can be because the darkest you are, you are not important, you are not human, your life is not valued. Her curly hair is unacceptable in the line of what it must be. Thank you for sharing. And, and, and um, Dr. Chancy, thank you for, for really capturing the reality of, of the aftermath and how that continues to be a factor in the way that we are perceived as people. And being the only Black-led organization at the US-Mexico border, I always say that it's a blessing and a curse, a blessing to be able to provide a home for our people, no matter where they are from, whether it is from Haiti, from Jamaica, from Cameroon, from Eritrea. But at the same time, it's a curse to be able to every day deal with the fact that our lives are, are not valued and to have to witness the harsh treatments of black bodies in mobility. And I can share with you from January 1st to this weekend, we have already buried six people in Tijuana. One was killed on January 1st, the others were literally due to lack of access to health, health equity, health justice. These are the realities of black people, but specifically so of Haitians because we dare to be, we dare to exist. Our very existence, our very resistance is unacceptable to the point where our cousins might be of lighter shades. Yes, we are still related, but still forced to straighten their hair and bleach their skin in order for them to be acceptable. But we are here, we'll continue to be here as the very cradle of the new world that has given us the world as we know it today. We will not be erased. We will not be dismissed. We will continue to push whether Shashi Lavi is at home or around the world, we will exist. So with that being said, we are having a few call to action, one, as I mentioned before, President Biden, Vice President Harris have deported over 20,000 people to Haiti, including pregnant women and children. We are asking them to stop the, the deportation, to stop the, the expulsion under the rules of Title 42, which again is using health to destroy lives. Title 42 should not exist. Title 42 must be ended. We cannot continue to use the pandemic and health to once again continue to destroy lives. The same thing that happened with Haitians who were fleeing Haiti in the 1970s, 1980s, we were, dumb, we, we were labeled carriers of AIDS, 4-H. Haitians were the very first part of what they called the reason why we had AIDS. Once again, using health in other to make sure that we as a people continues to be mistreated. The, the, the horrific images of Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay and Quom, the, 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 the thing that they have done to black bodies, to Haitian bodies is unacceptable. So ending of Title 42 and using the rules of health to continue to deport, expel, MPP continues to force people to stay in Mexico, not wanting to end it, but adding the entire Western Hemisphere, including Haitians, Jamaicans, Afro, Latinx is unacceptable. We are asking them to as well designate Cameroon for TPS. 
that continues to deal with extreme conditions at home. Our goal is we went to the border for the Haitians, but we stayed for everyone. Our fight continues at home and aboard. So we ask you to please join us in this call to action to end deportations and expulsions of Haitians, to release people who are still in immigration prisons for whom we are paying anywhere between 10 to $50,000 to get them released. And we are asking and calling for them to designate TPS for Cameroon. Thank you so much again, Amazing, thank you so much for sharing. And I wrote the, the call to actions um, that Ms. Joseph just shared with us in the chat. Um, so those of you who can um, review that. And then I see that um, Miriam wrote, um, I just wanna read it out uh, since she put it in there that she wrote in the White House in the fall about the deportations and for the first time received a form letter that didn't even reference the deportations, nice. <laughs> Um, I know that um, time is limited for you, um, Miriam, so I'm going to pose you the first question and then um, have the rest of the panelists uh, please uh, um, participate. Um, but one of the questions um, that we had was, what role do you see Pan-Africanism has in the global struggle against anti-Blackness migration? Well, I think, you know, in some ways, both Arlene and uh, Gyalin answered this question for us in the sense that there is no way forward without there being solidarity between people of African descent, whatever shade that we may be. Because uh, I think uh, Arlene uh, said it best when she, when she stated that, you know, if, if we are against Haitians for, you know, hair type, I, uh, you know, color, et cetera, we are against ourselves, right? And, and so I think Pan-Africanism in the sense of solidarity across, uh, you know, the African continent and diasporas has to be about understanding that when any of our people are put in a situation like Haitians have for political economic gain that has nothing to do with the livelihoods and ability of Haitians themselves to thrive, we have to ask ourselves the question, why are they being put in that situation and mobilize everything that we can? Because it is not only happening to Haitians, it is happening to other people of African descent around the world. Haitians are only a more visible uh, example of what can happen when a nation, a group of people is left to fend for themselves. Uh, and and I and I hate to be nationalistic about it as as a Haitian-born woman, uh, but it is very much a consequence of what Haiti has been able to do for itself in terms of self-liberation and supporting many people throughout the world. You know, especially in Latin America. You know, many parts of Latin America would not be free were it not for the Haitian Revolution. So it is a debt that is owed Haiti, but it's also a debt that we owe to ourselves as people of African descent wherever we are. Awesome, amazing. I think that um, one of the things that uh, we wanted to talk about also was in reflection of the aftermath of the earthquake, how, has the co how have the complexities of foreign aid actually affected um, and worsening, worsened the crisis in Haiti? That's an easy one for me to answer, <laughs> unfortunately. And it is part of what I addressed in the novel uh, and, and, and I know that some people who have read the novel don't, don't like this aspect of it because there is, a, especially from an American point of view, Americans like to think that they have brought a lot of assistance, you know, because the visuals seem to suggest it uh, in terms of the commission, which was led by uh, Clinton Bush, for example. Um, you know, so much money went into Haiti and this happens in every disaster situation. I'll give you an example that when I, I gave talks for about three years after the earthquake, and one of the first panels I was on had a photographer who had worked in the former, uh, you know, Yugoslav former Yugoslavia uh, uh, countries, and I and I remember asking him, I wonder, I wonder why you're here, and he said, Well, you'll find out in a minute. And what he talked about was how uh, the former Yugoslavia was descended upon at the end of the civil war by NGOs from all over the world and how you know, the exchange of goods 
and labor were never such that people could build, rebuild their own homes the way they wanted to with materials for their own countries. So that they were often left with worse structures than what they had before the war. And he said, this is what's going to happen in Haiti with it. And this was maybe a month or two after the earthquake. And this is exactly what happened. Um, I wasn't able to show the slide from the Haitian Times, but the Haitian Times slide from uh, January 12th of this year shows that only a thousand structures were built after the earthquake since 2010, a thousand. And when you think of the numbers of people who were left homeless and are still without shelter, that's only a small way to measure the degree of, of ineffective aid. And, and how is it that in a country of just a little over 8 million people, $16 billion enters the country and the, the average you know, monthly wage for people is less today in 2022 than it was in 2009 before the earthquake. I think that says everything about what's wrong with aid. Yes, absolutely. Um, we have a question in the chat and I'm encouraging anybody else who has questions to go ahead and, and throw them in the chat and we'll read them out to the panelists. Um, Antonia asks, is Pan-Africanism the solution? And this is for anybody who's on the panel. If I could expand, I'm going back to um, not only uh, Dubois, but uh, also other people of African descent, both in the US, in Brazil, and in Africa, who had an understanding that there was no difference among us, and that the struggle was a collective effort. And I think colonialism has really deepened that separation and uh, what was described that happened in Haiti and Yugoslavia is also in Brazil. Uh, the country is just struggling to become like the U.S., but making the same mistakes and having a president that modeled the past president of uh, the U.S. to disastrous effect. Um, Brazil has a very large population of people of African descent who are still really struggling. We never had a civil rights movement as they did here in the U.S., and the colorism that you have described is very much present in Brazil. So I'm just wondering what might be a solution or a way out for us. Antonia, I don't know, um, to be honest, if the um, Pan-Africanism is the whole solution, but many of the, um, of the, um, of the way they are um, vindicating, it can be used and uh, take it to another part of the world and it be implemented. But one of the first things we have to do as person and then as country is to really um, go back and think about it. Who are our reference? Who are the person that we are following? Which um, books are we reading? Who wrote those, those books? And then we can start um, changing our way of thinking. The colonialism is in our DNA, to be honest. You, and you can be um, decolizing yourself every day. Even when you... Um, I believe we as human beings, we are evolutioning all the time. So you can you can be um, in your in your whole life decol decolonizing yourself in many many ways, and you have also all the media pressures, all the you know all the law against um, what we are um, you know um, fighting. But you need to find a way. But the first is starting with who you are and uh, who are your reference. Uh, because um, some of the Pan-Africanism, um, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't share it completely. For example, the part of empowering 
I believe every one of us are already empowered. And uh, what we need is to take the place and um, say it loud to what you want to say, to yell it to the wall. If they don't want to give you the space, you need to take it, you know, so and, and say what you want to say. And it, it is not only being Afro defend, the descendant, even in the, fem, in, the, in the feminist movement here in Spain, we need to take the place, occupy it, and then say what you want to say. Because um, white feminists sometimes don't say, um, say, ah, you're my equal, but they don't treat you as an equal. Same here in the US, yeah. Yeah. That's a common, <laughs> so, and so, happens yeah, in Brazil so you can, too. I think yeah. colonialism is really the inheritance of all these ills that we're still dealing with. And until we I, have that honest conversation among ourselves, it's not going to happen between black people and white people or Spaniards and because nobody can really withstand the tension, but we need to have that conversation. Yeah, uh, even even when you come here, um, for example, and even I believe in the US, they don't, they don't, they say, oh, poor lady that ha had to, you know, migrate to here, migrate to here, and blah, 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 but you are the, what we say in Spanish, uh, in Spanish we say, el, el, um, ponerle color a la foto, so you are the, 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 you know, the different one that is not white, so you make a color in the picture, and, um, but they don't, they don't hear and they don't take your opinion into account. You're silenced, so, um, yeah. So, and I believe that also happened with trans person and uh, many other yeah. that education uh, in many countries doesn't take, um, you know, uh, really reference of everyone or, or yeah. all, all, the, all the ones that we say we are this, we are this uh, society. Yes. So we have to start to 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 make a you know an um, overview like an internal overview to see where you are, who you feel you are, and then what you want to to do to change the world or to change a part of it. I don't I don't I don't think we will change it the whole, completely, but yeah. what you can do to, to make it better. And um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate your words and I agree. A lot of my work when I do diversity, equity and inclusion, I base it on uh, generative engagement and really focus on voice, identity and power and how we really need to be well founded on our identity. We need to know who we are, who is our people, who are the people who came before us so that we can have that level. Um, thank you so very much. This has been just fascinating and unfortunately painful. Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you for that. Um, Garlene, did you wanna add? Uh, yes, but, but I think a lot have been said and going back to Haiti, right, the very, idea of, of building ourselves and creating an identity that was a contrary to what the world wanted to be able to, who's writing your, your story? Who is the author of your reality? And, and I think really connecting the African diaspora and being here in the United States as an immigrant, it has been extremely difficult how our very own communities are divided, right? And our call has been, how do we come together, united, understanding our shared, uh, our shared uh, existence, right? Yes. And understanding yes. that uh, uh, maybe, uh, may I call you Antonia, your, of your, your, your ancestors were taken to Brazil and mine to Haiti and yeah. uh, linked yours to the Dominican Republic on the island. And my friend who is uh, African-American to Virginia, mm. understanding that we are still a family we because are. they were ripped yeah. apart and sold to different parts, to different plantations and different masters. 
Yes. That doesn't mean we are no longer related. Right. What it means is that we have been literally ripped apart. We have been divided. And as of right now, I don't know if there's a name for it, but what we are doing and calling is for family reunification, is a Beautiful. family reunion for yeah. the people of African descent. And understand um, that we also have people saying, well, we don't want to deal with people in Africa or, or immigrants <laughs> from Africa yeah. because we, we, they, they abandoned us. But understanding we that those not. of us who were not taken were colonized. Mm -hmm. We were either taken and sold or colonized mm -hmm. in our own home. So yes. how do we make sure that we erase and move past the narratives and the stories that are being written by the others? We need to that tell are our being own stories. Yeah. By those who continue to be in power and continue to colonize our bodies and mind and soul for us to say enough is enough. So our call to action is a family connection, family reunion in order for us to move forward and create our own destiny. Yes, thank so you. I, I love thank that you. so, so much. And that like requires its own session. Um, yes, it does. Conversation requires its own session. And that, that is so important. Um, and I think this is an awesome way to, to close the session um, at the moment. I think. This has been incredibly enlightening for me um, and for many of the folks that I think have joined us today. Um, and I think an amazing way to honor um, the legacy of Dr. Paul Farmer as well to talk about this um, amongst us and amongst friends. Um, so thank you so much um, for all of our speakers. This has been amazing. Um, I feel like we need to have more sessions now <laughs> that have come out of the information that has come, um, that has come, come forth in these sessions. Something. Things stay broken